Now, with serious politics very much uppermost in our minds today, here perhaps is a timely antidote. Out of Order, a quiz about politics. In the chair, Patrick Hannon. Thank you very much. Thank you, hello and welcome to the program which shows that if you give a politician the chance to open his mouth, it won't be long before he puts his foot in it. <laughs> For as Chris Patton let slip, in a democracy, everyone has the right to be represented, including the jerks. And a very good job he makes of it too. <laughs> Representing, they claim, slightly more respectable constituencies are our regular team captains, Austin Mitchell, the Labour MP for Great Grimsby, and Julian Critchley, the Tory member for Aldershot. This week's guests are with Austin, broadcaster Martin Young, and with Julian, the Labour MP for Brent South, Paul Botang. Our scoring system for this final show of the series is based on the European electoral model. Two points if you answer correctly, one point if you're incorrect but amusing, then all marks are allotted on the single transferable point system, which means we won't have a result until a week next Sunday. <laughs> no scoring on Sunday. <laughs> the first round is an individual one based on quotations which today have an educational feel to them. Austin Mitchell. Who here gives us all a lesson? I know some of my political opponents like to say they sent their children to state schools, but in most cases I regard that as either hypocrisy or sacrificing their own children to promote their own political careers. Jack Straw. Not, not Jack Straw. Baker. You didn't... Kenneth uh, Baker. No, it's not Kenneth Baker either. <laughs> Jack Straw, your colleague, saying that... Uh, People should go to public schools. Oh, yes, you're right. That was a particularly yeah, dozy answer, wasn't it? I, I think... <laughs> um, Paul, my it partial... John Major, John Major. No, no, well, hang Clark. on, hang Kenneth on, Paul. Clark. Kenneth Clark. Kenneth Clark. Yeah, well, Kenneth Clark is right. I thought that we'd get Paul to tell you what Labour Party policy was first off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't confuse him. <laughs> That's never stopped Austin in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth Clark is, uh, is right. And, of course, you all send your children to state schools, or send all your children to state schools. It's not quite the same thing. I'd send I do. They keep sending them back school. again is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that was Education Secretary Kenneth Clark alleging that politicians who send their own children to state schools are only sacrificing them to promote their political careers. Judging by his policies, Mr Clark would obviously much rather sacrifice other people's children to promote his own career. <laughs> Julian Critchley, who here admits to being a dilatory pupil? I shouldn't say this on a children's show, but fooling around was what I was best at at school. Can't be Edwina Curry. I mean, she's the standard answer to all these questions. Fooling around. Wait For once, it is not Edwina Curry. Kenneth John Clark. Major. Kenneth Clark again. Not Kenneth Clark John again. Major. Not John Major. Norma I don't think you fooled about. I, you know, I can't see John Cecil Major. Cecil Parkinson, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was after school, wasn't it? <laughs> Behind the back sheds. Ah, <laughs> uh, Paul, someone, someone you're close to. I'm being very helpful. But I'm close. To Not you. Julian, I mean, I don't Neil mean Kinnock. that. Neil Kinnock. Neil Kinnock is right. Ah. Yes. Cecil Parkinson was a better answer, you, though, wasn't you, it? You're going to have a point for that. That was Neil Kinnock saying that the most useful thing he learned in school was how to fool around, a training which has proved an ideal qualification for his current job. <laughs> Martin Young, who's the subject of this mean attack? Some men are born mediocre, some men achieve mediocrity, and some men have mediocrity thrust upon them. With him, it's been all three. I think the audience helped me there. It's got to be John Major. That nice Mr. Greyman. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much, audience. I, have you heard about the time John Major took LSD? He saw, no, I haven't heard that. He saw grey vividly. <laughs> that was so easy, and the, the audience is so far ahead of you, Martin. Uh, <laughs> oh, you can't deduct marks. I'm not going to deduct marks. I'm going to ask you who said it. Ah. 
<laughs> Come along then, audience. <laughs> um, it, it, it must have been a, a dreadful socialist like Austin who said it. Um, well, he's not a very good socialist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the last surviving socialist, do you mind? Um, I, went into, I went into the Labour Party canteen at Walworth Road uh, the other day and asked for socialism and the waitress said, socialism's off, dear. <laughs> Was it, uh, what did they have instead, Austin? <laughs> Chips. <laughs> was it uh, Gerald Kaufman? No, it wasn't Gerald Robin Kaufman. Robin Cook? It wasn't Robin Cook. It was uh, not an MP. Uh, it was Tom Sawyer, the trade union leader, Tom Sawyer, at the 1991 Labour Party conference, uh, accusing John Major of being thricely mediocre. Mr Major later happily admitted that he had achieved mediocrity, but he couldn't remember how many O-levels he got in it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> There's nothing quite like having Austin <laughs> on, on a programme. It makes it... You tickled his fancy, Patrick. It, ma it makes everything seem so worthwhile. <laughs> Finally in this round, Paul Botang. Who's this coming out against the vulgar fraction? Only in Britain could it be thought a defect to be too clever by half. The probability is that too many people are too stupid by three quarters. <laughs> Edwina Curry again. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, Keith. Mm. Sir Keith Joseph. Not Sir Keith Joseph. Uh, more up to date than that. Everybody's more up to date than Sir Keith Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is, it could be anybody. Give us another. Clue. Well, it could be anybody. It's the person who was the answer to the last question. Can you remember that? <laughs> John Major. I don't know what's the matter with you. <laughs> John, John Major said Well, that. one could say many things about John Major, but not that he was too clever by half. <laughs> uh, it was John Major complaining that in Britain many people are too stupid by three quarters. <laughs> However, Kenneth Clark has assured the Prime Minister that after his education reforms, they'll only be too stupid by 75%. <laughs> and he'll still send his children to public school. <laughs> At the end of the round, the scores are Austin Mitchell and Martin Young, five, Julian Critchley and Paul Boteng, nil. <laughs> round two is another individual round in which we blow the grime from some sound archive recordings with a yes. francophone feel and ask for identification of the speaker and their subject. Uh, Julian Critchley, who here makes a gem of a speech? Fun and elected its president. She selected him after a very democratic and clear campaign. You, my countrymen, have designated me for this office. Maurice Chevalier. <laughs> Posing as Valérie Giscard d'Estaing. That was Valérie Giscard d'Estaing speaking in 1974 on the occasion of his election as French president. Giscard lost office in 1981 following allegations that he'd received gifts of gems from President Bokassa, which disproved the old adage, diamonds are a Gaul's best friend. Oh. <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Martin, who's showing fraternity with liberty here? Happy birthday, United States. <laughs> Happy birthday, Miss Liberty. Is it uh, Francois Mitron? Very good. Now say that in English. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Mr. Mitron. <laughs> Is it all right? That's very good, yes. Oh, Francois Mitron. Do you know what he was... Um doing? What, what, why he was saying Are you that? asking me this for points or are just out of sheer devilry? Out of sheer interest. Because no, I know you can well, speak he, to us at length on this subject. My, my <laughs> colleague appears to be totally on top of this one. No, he doesn't. Uh, but it was, wasn't it uh, the refurbishing of the Statue of Liberty? That's so good, you can have an extra point for that. I think Austin thing. would be very pretty on top of the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> 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 Neil Kinnig has, Often. Neil Kinnig has <laughs> offered him to the United just States. In <laughs> just impaled him. have him. That was François Mitterrand in 1986, wishing both America and the renovated Statue of Liberty a happy birthday. The celebration was marred when United States President Gerald Ford discovered that he was unable to chew birthday cake and walk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll go on. Uh, Paul, who's setting her cap at whom here? We said 
and months ago that uh, we would like to come to an arrangement, of course. Uh, that arrangement wasn't possible. And now she, she said very clearly some days ago that there wouldn't be any prices for farmers in the whole of Europe. This is a sort of terrorism. There wouldn't be any, any prices for the farmers if she doesn't have her piece of cake, or I don't know how she said, or piece of bread, or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> is this uh, Madame Cresson? It is, Madame. To cast aspersions on our man. English masculinity. Madame Thatcher. Yeah. When she was going about English masculinity. Madame Croissant. Mrs. Thatcher. Man, was worried about. She cast aspersions on our manhood. Never mind Mrs. Thatcher. Oh, well, she did later. Yes, yeah. but she was m <laughs> more worried. She was concerned about, about our beef then, was she? Well, she was. <laughs> she... <laughs> it was. Madame Edith Cresson, in uh, 1982, when she was French Agriculture Minister, complaining about Mrs. Thatcher's stance in CAP negotiations. The reference to Mrs. Thatcher's concern with pieces of cake reminded many people of Marie Antoinette, although it was to take eight years before the Iron Lady got the chop and was replaced by her eminence grise. No. Austin Mitchell, who's announcing a general departure here? Française. Français, le général de Gaulle est mort. La France est veuve. En 1940, de Gaulle a sauvé l'honneur. Right. Je Austin. crois que ça, c'est le président Pompidou. Very good, yes. You're going to finish Et the moi, answer. J'ai une histoire du général de Gaulle. Uh, a friend of mine went to interview de Gaulle uh, when, he was, uh, when he was president. Uh, it was the early 60s. And uh, de Gaulle expressed his regret at not being able to invite him for lunch and said, J'avais voulu vous inviter à déjeuner avec moi, mais là, il faut que je dîne avec le président d'un de ces états nègres, le Martinique, je crois. <coughs> The French people in the audience loved that one. Both of them. <laughs> I think you told that better the last time. <laughs> yeah. It would sound great with subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, just to interpret Austin, Georges Pompidou speaking in 1970 on the occasion of the death of Charles de Gaulle. Pompidou had succeeded de Gaulle as president the previous year and soon found a way of giving the British even more to moan about than his predecessor by actually allowing them to join the common market. <laughs> At the end of the round, the scores are Austin Mitchell and Martin Young, 10, Julian Critchley and Paul Boutang, 4. Yeah, <laughs> the next round asks our guests to prove that instead of making voters cry, they can create tears of laughter too by telling us a joke. To put them in a mirth-making mood, we'll resurrect a corny gag each and invite them to better it. First of all, a joke. A big Washington charity dinner was about to start when one of the guests, Dan Quayle, turned up without his invitation. He attempted to explain who he was to the doorman, but was still not allowed entry. How can I be sure you're who you say you are, asked the doorman. An hour ago, Pavarotti arrived without his invitation. He just sang a few notes and I knew him. Then David Hockney forgot his invitation. Just a few lines on a piece of paper. Who are these guys, Paravati and Derek Hackney? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need to hear, said the doorman. You're Dan Quayle. <laughs> Martin Young. Well, I can't match that. That's too good. Um, I just thought that a, a little touch of the problems in Russia might, might help poor folk in Russia. It's uh, the scene is a large department store in Moscow, and a customer walks in and says quite reasonably, have you got any caviar? And the assistant says, sorry, we are the department where there is no meat. Over there is the department where there isn't any caviar. <laughs> <laughs> Well, two points or 50,000 rubles. Yes, 100,000 rubles, you're too late. It's gone up again. Well, as it's the last show in the series, I'm afraid that tradition demands that we ask Austin to tell us a joke as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a small village in Scotland dominated by, not the Kirk, the wee frees, very strict. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the rector was extremely angry about the lack of 
faith in the village and the failure of the message to get through. And he gave a devastating sermon to the packed church one Sunday and stood up there and said, The wrath of the Lord will descend on you. In this village, he said, there's the heing and the sheing. There's the concupiscence and there's the envy. And come the day of judgment, you'll all be cast into the bottomless pit. And there'll be all the boiling tar and the oil. And you'll say, Lord, Lord, help us, we did not ken. And the Lord, in his infinite mercy, will look down and say, Well, you ken the new. <laughs> I wish Austin would stop telling all these jokes in French. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Bojang, listen to this. A high-ranking official of the Chinese Communist Party visited a country school to ensure its pupils were receiving the correct indoctrination. Li Peng, he asked one boy, who is your father? My father is the People's Republic, replied the lad. Well done, and who is your mother? My mother is the Marxist, Leninist, Maoist Communist Party. You have learned well. And what would you like to be when you are grown? An orphan. <laughs> Paul. Well, uh, my uh, story is about uh, a vicar who's not a Scottish Presbyterian hellfire and brimstone minister, but a Church of England, South, South of England vicar. Poor old soul lying uh, on uh, his deathbed and the vicar says you've led a long and industrious life what uh, what would you like us to write on your gravestone he says well vicar something something short something simple like back in five minutes <laughs> Two points for you as well. I think Voltaire approached on his deathbed by a priest and asked, did he now repent the devil and all his sins, said, this is no time to be making unnecessary enemies. <laughs> <laughs> Julian Critchley, it, uh, the, I'm afraid well, that balance demands you tell a joke as well. Uh, as an ambitious conservative looking forward to another four years in the House of Commons, and you've all been so beastly about John Major, I must tell a story about our great leader. Um, who expired three quarters of the way through Desert Island Discs when Sue Lawley asked him a question and he went up to heaven and he knocked on the gates and there was St Peter who said, who are you? So John Major Ball explained at great length that he was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom but St Peter wouldn't believe him. So John looked over St Peter's shoulder and there sitting under a luxuriant tree sipping a drink was Margaret Thatcher <laughs> and he said look there's Margaret Thatcher you ask her who I am she'll put you right St Peter said that's not Margaret Thatcher that's God <laughs> <laughs> Well, everybody got lots of points. It brings us to the end of the round. <laughs> the, the scores now are Austin Mitchell and Martin Young, 14. Julian Critchley and Paul Boutang, 8. <laughs> the next round has us taking in some foreign airs as our teams demonstrate that all those expenses paid fact-finding junkets are worth it by identifying some national anthems. Today's tunes have an easy theme you can bank on. Nobody wants to win this one. <laughs> <laughs> Austin and Martin, where does this anthem get directive to the point? what you said, an EC theme you can bank on. Yes, that was a play on words. Um, EC, European Community, EC or EC, you can bank on. I've got to explain these to you now. This is getting <laughs> terrible. Bank on. Bank on. Bank on. Luxembourg. 
It's no, a it's European not Luxembourg. Bank. No, it's not a, it's a national anthem. Of the European Bank. <laughs> I promise you. It's decreed. Belgium. Well, Belgium, all right. That was La Brabanson, the anthem that sets Belgian hearts racing. Wasn't it good? <laughs> we won't, we won't, we'll resist the temptation to play it again. Has it been set to music? <laughs> I've got to tell you that under the 1839 Treaty of London, Britain recognised Belgium's independence and perpetual neutrality. One of the reasons the great powers recognised Belgium was so it could act as a buffer zone between France and Germany. Unfortunately, they omitted to tell the Belgians that one of the main functions of a buffer is to be crashed into unexpectedly by massive forces. <laughs> uh, Julian and Paul, to which nation's spirits does this anthem unlock the vault? This is a Commonwealth nation. No, it's not a Commonwealth no, it's not. nation. It's, it's, would, it, would, it, would it in better <laughs> circumstances have been a Commonwealth nation? Oh, no. Well, I mean, both enough. tunes have uh, something in common. Do you have to cross water to get there? You have to cross water to get nearly everywhere. From I here. know. <laughs> I wondered where you'd wake up to that. <laughs> except, except Thank you, Chairman. How about no flies on you, clearly. Well, but You'll soon, go far. But soon you won't have to. Soon you won't have to. No, no, that's true. Well, originally, it was a German <laughs> hymn tune, wasn't it? It's not the Austrian national anthem. No. I mean, we were talking about the European... Well, it's, uh, it's a European, it's European one. It's not... Uh, not necessarily you, Austrian. Is it a member of the... It's team? already been mentioned, but since you mentioned... Luxembourg. So Lichtenstein. Luxembourg. Lichtenstein. <laughs> <laughs> you mean? That, that is Maxwell's personal anthem. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't stand well, he up for it, it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that was, as Robert Maxwell could have told you, the national anthem of Liechtenstein. Inhabitants of the Principality deny their anthem means that they have any similarity with Britain, right. pointing out that one country has a banking system which looks after the rich, is uncooperative and good at hiding dubiously obtained money, whereas Liechtenstein is completely different. <laughs> because Julian didn't stand up. That brings us to the end of the round. The scores are Austin Mitchell and Martin Young, 16. Julian Critchley and Paul Boutang, 13. <laughs> now it's time to audit our team's knowledge of the ins and outs of party funding. And we don't mean who picks up the bill for the annual backbenchers, friends of Ann Summers, cheese and wine bash. <laughs> The object is to answer as many of 15 questions as possible in two minutes. First person to hit their bell or buzzer and supply the correct answer gets the point. If they're wrong, it's open to the other team, and it starts now. Roughly what proportion of Conservative Party funds is received from corporations and companies? Yes, Paul? 60%. No? It... An eighth. No, it's a third. Roughly what percentage of Labour Party funds comes from trade unions? Uh, yes, Austin? 95%. No, that's wrong. 90%. No, it's 75%. 75%. Which supermarket chain used to make large donations... Sainsbury's. No. To, no. to the SDP. Sainsbury's is right, Austin, well, as a point yeah. of view. <laughs> Which union is claimed to give Labour more money than companies give the Conservatives? Yes, Sir Austin. Transport and General. Transport and General Workers Union is right. Which company gives most to the Conservatives? Yes, Austin. Tobago House. No. United Biscuits. United Biscuits is right, Paul, a point for you. Which drive on the left company is a backer of the Liberal Democrats? British yes, School of Austin. Motoring. British School of Motoring is right. Which flag flyer announced in 1991... British Airways. British Airways. What did he announce? Bri British Airways. But he wasn't, wasn't, wasn't giving any more money. Well, more money. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Austin buzzed first, <laughs> and the answer is yes, the, the British Airways wouldn't give anything to the Tories, and it was Lord King, uh, the chairman of British Airways. Who described this announcement as sounding like... Uh, <laughs> 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 
God, I hate these overachievers. <laughs> who described his announcement as sounding like an indignant restaurateur who had paid off the racketeers for years? You don't know. It was the Times. Uh, which publisher gave a well-publicised £43,000 to Labour at its 1984 conference? Uh, yes, Julian. Maxwell. Robert Maxwell is right. Which organisation, headed by the then Labour leader and chief whip, received £38,000 from Maxwell two years previously? Uh, yes, Sir Julian. ITV? No. No, no, the, headed by the Labour leader and the chief. It was the Boundary Commission Fighting Fund set oh, up yeah. to prevent the loss of Labour votes in constituency boundary changes. Who was the Greek shipping millionaire reported to have given the Conservatives £2 million? Pounds? Yes, uh, Austin. I, I don't know his name, oh, except he'd moved from the Colonels to the Majors, but... Uh, Paul, you <laughs> Mr Zidiopoulos. No, it was uh, Mr John Letsis. <laughs> Who, well, who, there was a if in it. Who is the Hong Kong businessman alleged to have donated £100,000 to the Tories? <laughs> Yes, uh, Martin. Li Pao. Li? No, I don't think it's Li Pao. <laughs> Yin Tang. <laughs> Yin Tang. <laughs> Yin Tang Yin Lai Pao. Worse by anything. Do you know Paul and Julian? No, you don't. It is a name like Li Pao. It is Li Ka Shing. Which non TUC union is a large contributor to the Labour Party? <laughs> yes, uh, Austin. Oh. Uh, ETU. Uh, WTPU, as it's now called, is right, the Electricians' Union. Which privatised haulage firm shareholders have voted against making political donations, Paul? National Carriers. Uh, uh, National Freight Corporation. National Freight. All right, National Freight Corporation National is Freight. right, Martin. <laughs> that brings us to the, the end of the round. <laughs> yeah, cheer up. For God's sake, cheer up, Austin. <laughs> If I can just mention this. <laughs> Must you? <laughs> this brings us to the end of the round and the end of the contest. The final scores are Julian Critchley and Paul Boteng, 20, but Austin Mitchell and Martin Young, 26. <laughs> and since, since this is also the end of the series, I can report that of the six contests, Julian Critchley's teams have won one, and Austin's teams have won five. <laughs> so, as the winners try to take the surprised look off their faces, all that remains is to thank Austin Mitchell, Julian Critchley, Paul Boteng and Martin Young, and to leave you with this quote from Harlow's MP, Jerry Hayes, which may well lose him the husband's vote in his constituency. I don't kiss babies, I kiss their mothers. They're the ones that vote. <laughs> Out of Order was presented by Patrick Hannon with readings by Peter Donaldson. The series is written and compiled by Michael Dines and produced by Diane Messias.